Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 1 p.m. to 1.30 p.m. session of the 2016 Open Simulator Community Conference. As a reminder to our in-world and web audience, you can view the full conference schedule at conference.opensimulator.org and tweet your questions and comments to at OpenSimCC with the hashtag OSCC16. This session, we're happy to introduce a terrific presentation called Open Simulator Statistics. Our speaker today is Maria Koroloff, and Maria probably doesn't need much of an in uh, introduction to everyone in the audience, but I'm going to go ahead and give it anyway, just because it's so impressive. Maria writes about enterprise security for CSO Magazine and is editor and publisher of Hypergrid Business, my favorite, an online publication focusing on enterprise applications of metaverse virtual environments. Also, Maria has over 20 years of experience as a business and technology journalist, including reporting for the Chicago Tribune, Rutgers, UPI, and AP. She was managing editor of the Moscow Daily and bureau chief of the Shanghai Business News Bureau. Today, she lives in Massachusetts, writes technology feature stories, edits nonfiction books about China, and runs an influential blog about immersive technology. Welcome, Maria, and attendees, let's begin the session. Well, thank you very much, Kay, for that introduction. Can everybody hear me okay? I'm not hearing any no's, so I assume that the answer is yes. Um, so um, as Kay mentioned, I edit Hyper Good Business. I've been doing that for seven years. And um, every month I collect open sim statistics from all the grids. So um, uh, I look at all the public grids. I looked at their active user numbers. I look at their registrations. I look at their region counts in terms of standard region equivalents, because some grids have bigger regions than others. Um, and I put it all together into a monthly report, and I'm proud to say I haven't missed a stats report yet. Woohoo! Um, so that's a, that's a lot of monthly stats reports um, that I've put together. Um, and um, this is a um, this has been a weird a very weird year for for open sim. Uh, we've had some ups and downs um, in all the statistics. Um, and we have we've had some uh, some outages. We had some new grids. Um, we had some old grids kind of falling off. Um, and um, and uh, the big story this year has been the continuing growth of movement to the hypergrid. There are now 33,000 active users total in OpenSAM, uh, which, which does include some double counting since uh, a person can be active on more than one grid. Uh, so if you've logged into more than one grid over the course of a month, you will, you will show up as an active user in both places. Now that's down a little bit from its peak of 35,000 in the summer. Uh, that was just before Avenation uh, had an outage, and Avenation is is one of the uh, oldest grids in OpenSim, and uh, they've been down ever since then. They've got some server issues um, that they're still working on. Uh, so that that was that's the little fall off that was that happened in the summer. Um, so the blue area in this chart is all the hypergrid uh, users. The dark uh, orange area is in worlds, which is currently the biggest closed commercial grid. So you can't hypergrid into other grids. And the yellow region at the bottom is all the other grids that are closed. So as you can see from this chart, there's been a dramatic shift over the last um, couple of years or so to the hypergrid. If you're if you're a closed grid, unless you have a very specific reason for that, like you're an educational grid or um, you have a particular role-playing game that you want to you know, have custom avatars for just that game and custom content, um, or, or there's some other reason why you, know, you need to be closed. For the most part, being open to the hypergrid means that anybody can access your grid from all over, and you're not limited to just the people and the content who are resident on your grid, but it opens up you up to the entire metaverse. Um, so this has been a dramatic shift for uh, OpenSim. 
I'm particularly enthusiastic about it because I love the hypergrid. It's in the title of hypergrid business. Um, I'm a big fan of it. Uh, but there, but there is a role in place for, for closed grids as well, especially for the enterprise sector, which I'm also a big fan of. Um, so um, uh, the number of public grids uh, has uh, dropped a little bit um, over the past um, year or so, and um, the, the, the part, part of it is the data gathering, how, I mean, I, uh, there's no way to know exactly the total number of grids that are out there. Um, I go through Google searches, people send me links to new grids, um, they pop up in various directories in the social media, um, and I track them that way. Um, and uh, by public grid, I mean a grid that you can create an account on or you can teleport to. So. Uh, there's been some consolidation. Uh, some of the larger grids have been getting larger, um, and some of the smaller grids have been kind of falling off off the charts altogether. Um, land area is is continuing to go up steadily. Now there's a big jag up and down on this chart, and that has to do with the virtual worlds grid, which had just giant uh, a bit of open a wide open landscape which is technically speaking land, so I'm counting it as land, but um, they, they uh, loaded it up and then they took it down again. So that explains the, the, the jump up and then the jump down. But as you can see, uh, otherwise the general trend is upwards. And um, I think that's a sign of the benefits of OpenSIM is that people can have land to play with, uh, very low cost land to play with. And uh, this is one of the major selling points of OpenSTEM uh, after, of course, the hypergrid and the ability to make backups of, of all your stuff. Um, another uh, growing uh, field for OpenSTEM is the Kitely market. The number of products for sale, they're now over 16,000 in different variations and they deliver to over 160 grids. And Elon Tochner will be um, on a panel tomorrow to give some more details about what's happening. Uh, you don't have to be on a hypergrid to accept deliveries from the Kitely market, um, but if you are on a hypergrid, it's a lot easier. Um, it's kind of enabled by default. The grids don't have to do anything. And it's uh, it's become the marketplace uh, for, uh, for the hypergrid. And as you can see, that's where all the content growth has been. Merchants have really been embracing it. And I think that the Kitely market in combination with Linda Kelly have done a lot to clean up the content rights issue in OpenSIM because there's now great sources for high quality free content that's fully licensed from Linda Kelly and a good source for high quality low priced content or reasonably priced content from the Kitely market, which is also fully licensed. Um, and that reduces any kind of um, people saying, oh, we can't get anything in OpenSIM, we have to pirate content. Well, no, you don't. There's, there's the content issue um, has been addressed quite a bit. Um, now, one of the, for, for me, one of the positive uh, statistics, uh, especially in the past year, has been the growth in readership. Uh, I mentioned earlier that we had about 33,000 active users in OpenSIM, and for the most part, the readership of hypergrid business has been between 20 and 30,000 read, unique readers a month. That has jumped up to over 100,000 a month in the last few months. Uh, over the past 30 days, according to Google Analytics, I just checked it this morning, we had uh, nearly 125,000 unique readers and about a quarter million total page views. So these are all people coming to Hypergood Business most of them, unfortunately, are not coming for OpenSIM. They're coming for the VR headset QR codes and the headset reviews. Um, but hopefully they're looking at, you know, some of the OpenSIM related ads and content and maybe getting interested in it. Um, that was the idea. Uh, that's why I started covering uh, virtual reality in the first place, because I see open uh, from the very beginning, I saw OpenSIM as the natural progression into a virtual reality metaverse. I thought that we were the way to do this. Um, so um, so that's kind of why I've been 
really, really focusing on VR. And now um, a lot of the majority of the readers are coming for the VR content. Uh, so can OpenStim make the jump uh, f uh, to VR? And uh, that's something that um, I'm, I'm not sure about. I, I listened to the previous uh, presentations earlier today, and I talked to a lot of the folks. I know that Moses is working on a web-based viewer, and the platform that they've picked does support mobile-based VR. So maybe, in theory, someday, um, uh, I... I uh, I, I really don't know. I'm seeing a lot of social VR happening on other platforms that are VR from the ground up, like Altspace VR, like VR Chat. Um, folks like um, Sinewave Space are building free uh, free regions that you can have um, that you can get started in that is natively a VR based on Unity. A lot of stuff is happening. The investment seems to be on that side of it rather than over here, and that's kind of that's kind of really worrying. Um, so we do have Oculus Rift support with the Control Studio Viewer. We are open source. We do have a large and very varied ecosystem. We do allow user-created content. Those are all great things. We do not have a, vis a usable VR viewer. We do not have a strong use case for VR in OpenSim yet. I, I'm hoping that um, somebody will come up with one, but I haven't seen one yet. We don't have free region hosting for OpenSim. For VR users, I think that's something that would be super useful, but um, we're going to have scalability issues that we have to deal with first. And of course, name recognition for, for OpenSim, I think that will come if we can address the other issues. Meanwhile, on the virtual reality side, um, I just got stats from Superdata uh, last week, and there's now 84 million virtual reality headsets that are mobile-based in use and another 4 million of console and um, uh, PC-based headsets. So um, this is kind of what it looks like. Uh, oh, pretty much 98% of the headsets are mobile-based. A tiny little sliver are PC-based and a tiny little sliver are console-based. So if you're thinking about where to go to address the biggest market, we do need to have a mobile-based VR viewer for OpenSim. Right now, the Control Studio Viewer is, is PC-based, um, and it is difficult um, also to use. Uh, we've got frame rate problems and interface issues as well uh, for, before it can be really usable. Those have to be fixed. Um, there's, uh, there are some surveys about what VR users want, and what they want is, first of all, virtual tourism and travel. They want movies and videos. They want live events. Um, they want uh, home decorating stuff. Um, they want educational content, um, and, and they want games. So games, as you can see, at the, pretty much at the bottom of this list. Uh, virtual travel is great on mobile headsets because th basically this is 360 videos and 360 photos, and it puts you right there. As far as users are concerned, and, and me as well, you really do feel like you've been teleported somewhere else. Um, even when it's not fully 3D, but kind of like a, uh, a 360 picture that's around you or a 360 video that's around you and not doesn't really have depth, it still kind of gives you the sense of being somewhere else. And it is very, very cool. I do demos for people of virtual reality headsets, like regular people, and um, that's what they love. They love the videos. They love um, the virtual movie theater. They love the travel apps. So that is definitely exciting. Um, I'm not seeing a lot of use for open sim though in these categories. So that's also um, a very worrying thing. Um, so uh, I'm told to wrap up. This is my uh, content information, Maria at hypergoodbusiness.com. The, the slides are also online at, and I just posted um, the link in the world and here it is on the slides as well. And then if you have any questions, um, you can uh, text me or you can uh, pass them along through, um, I guess, anybody else, really, um, or, or local, <laughs> yeah, regular people. Uh, yeah, so um, a lot of the media attention is based on the gadget writers and the tech writers. 
and we get demos. So I've had some fantastic demos of like the HTC Vive and stuff that were just amazing and mind blowing. But I have to say that the best headset I've actually used when I take out to like say library groups and school boards and you know local business offices, the one that people really have been really loving lately is the Daydream View headset. It, that's just blowing people away. The controller is so easy to use. The price is on target. Um, it's very user-friendly interface. Uh, people are really, really loving it. If you're out in the market for a new phone and a new headset, I strongly recommend the Pixel phone and the Daydream View headset as this is the thing you should be aiming for. That's um, a great a place to stop. <laughs> Thank you, Maria, for the tip on the Daydream Viewer headset and Pixel phone and for a terrific presentation. As a reminder to our audience, you can see what's coming up on the conference schedule at, again, conference.opensimulator.org. Following this section, session, the next session will begin at 1.30 p.m. in this region and is entitled Spanish Language Learning at Escape using virtual worlds to teach language. Also, we encourage you to visit the OSCC 16 Poster Expo on the Expo 3 region to find accompanying information on presentations and explore the Hypergrid Tour resources that are in Expo 2. And also take a look at all of the sponsor and crowdfunder booths located throughout all of the Expo regions. Thank you again, Maria, and thank you for, to the audience, and see you at the next session.